So I want to thank Reverend Catherine Bonin for that wonderful story today, as well as Gary Lynn Floyd and Karen Mitchell and our own CSL music team for the fabulous music that supports the message. We're continuing with our September theme of Celebrate Love and Joy. And our topic today is Love Can Move the World. Our message today is about how to be love under all circumstances and about how to look back and ask that our residual sadness, our residual frustration, anger, or hurt, anything from the past that is keeping us from love, be released. And we're learning how we might learn to see all things in our life as either love or a call for love. I know you've heard me say that before, and it's an important message. Even more important, is that we learn to answer those calls for love with love. When we learn to tap fully into living into the divine creation that we are, it becomes easier to love completely and to answer all calls with love. So, as usual, I have the question of the week. What is that one choice that you can make today to look at the world through the lens of love, to embrace your originality, to vision a world of love, and engage in being love. One more time. What is, what is the one choice that you can make today to look at the world through a lens of love, embrace your originality, vision a world of love, and engage in being love. The title of Love Can Move the World might have you thinking, I'm not sure I believe that love can move the world, or that's quite an ambitious thought. And therein actually lies the problem that keeps the world from revolving always in love. It's essential that we all embrace that love can move the world if we wish to see it. It seems to be the month for me creating acronyms, so I have one for love this week. L for lens, C through the eyes of love, O for originality, B your unique self, V for vision, be clear about your destination, E for engagement, Create a life of acceptance. Let's take a look at each of those components, starting with L for lens. Seeing the world through our own eyes. Everyone loves a good story. Perhaps that's why we live in a world of so many stories. And we definitely are attached to how we see the world from our own viewpoint and our own life story. There was a young couple who moved into a new neighborhood and the very first morning they were eating breakfast, the young woman watched out her window and noticed her neighbor hanging clothes outside. That laundry is not very clean, she said. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. Her husband looked on, but remained silent. Every time her neighbor would hang laundry out to dry, the young woman would make the same comments. About a month later, the woman was surprised to see a nice clean wash. Everything hanging on the line appeared to be sparkling. And she said to her husband, look, she's learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her that. The husband sat there and then quietly said, I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. And so it is with life. Everyone sees the world through their unique lens based upon their own story and the filters that they've had in their own world. 
We have the story of our families of origin, our birth order, our culture, our beliefs, our upbringing, our values. There are so many factors which shape and influence our perspective on life and influence that story of our lives. There's so many we have an interpretation of how life has touched us until we become aware of the interpretation, our story, which may or may not serve us. Being prone to be a people pleaser, I used to listen to someone tell me advice or complain to me or an interpretation of something without discerning how valid it was for me or for my personal need. If we can discern where someone is coming from based upon their own personal history, their own life story, then this can help us see past their filters into what is best in the moment. And we can learn to answer their calls for love with love. Think about your own life story for a minute, the significant events, the turning points in your life. That story tells you a lot about your values and the beliefs which you have adopted in the creation of your present reality. And it also tells you about the lens through which you see things. The pencil maker took the pencil away just before putting it in its special box and said, there are five things you need to know before I send you out into the world. Always remember them and never forget and you will become the best pencil you can be. One, you will be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. Two, you will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you'll need it to become a better pencil. Three, you will be able to correct any mistakes you might make. Four, the most important part of you will always be what's inside. And five, on every surface you are used, you must leave your mark. No matter what the condition, you must continue to write. The pencil understood and promised to remember and went into the box with purpose in his heart. The interesting thing is we're all like pencils. So always remember the five things and never forget. And you will become the best person you can be. One, you'll be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in God's hands and allow other humans to access you for the many gifts you have to offer. Two, you will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but going through some of life's problems, you will become a stronger person. Three, you'll be able to correct any mistakes you might make. Four, the most important part of you is what's inside. And five, on every surface that you walk, you must leave your mark. No matter what the situation, you must continue to do your duties. This parable about the pencil encourages you to know that you are special, you are unique, you are an original. So never allow yourself to get discouraged and think that your life is insignificant and you can't change it or make a change in the world. And that moves us into O for originality. 
We opened the service with the song, I Love Myself the Way I Am. I wonder how many of us can really claim that daily or even feel it. How often do you let your light shine? How often do you engage in rules and responsibilities where you can fulfill your need to create, contribute, and express your unique strengths and talents? Some people know at an early age exactly what they want to be, where they want to play in life. And more often than not, people go into a particular career or a line of work because of what their parents did or because of what their teachers said, or peers. We don't actually always make our own decisions. Did you know that if you ask most people what their unique gifts and talents are, they will respond with what they can't do or don't do well. We are so good at sharing our own inadequacies. In the past, many people didn't even think to ask the questions, who am I? Or what is my purpose? Or how might I serve? This is changing dramatically, thank goodness, in our modern world. I think out of necessity. Frederick Butcher said this, your vocation in life is where your greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. Let me repeat that. Your vocation in life is where your greatest joy meets the world's greatest needs. And the good news is you can facilitate this awakening to your greatest joy for yourself. Here's a few questions you can ask yourself. What did I love to do when I was a child? What was I drawn to do and why? What did I receive praise for without feeling it was any effort at all? Howard Thurman once said, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. What the world needs is people who have come alive. Have you noticed that owning your greatness is often a challenge? We love to own our inadequacies. We have a fear of being inadequate. And for Southern women, we were taught if we owned our greatness, that was bragging. It's not true. Marianne Williamson's in her book, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles, wrote this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We're born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we consciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Imagine letting go of the signpost of inadequacies in your life and beginning to chart a roadmap for your life with consistent signposts of magnificence with many variables around the main plot of your life. Imagine playing big in life. And what if you learn to appreciate and understand the talents 
and challenges inherent in other people. Remember, our theme this month is celebrate love and joy. With that new understanding of each person's originality, especially our own, we can begin to find acceptance and appreciate and celebrate our differences. And again, we can learn to answer those calls of love with love. We all come into this world as an original. No one wants to leave it as a copy. Whose life are you living? At the retreat, I heard Michael God, a wonderful new thought musician and spiritual leader, remind us of a quote from Roosevelt. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. When I first started at the Center for Spiritual Living in Southeast Louisiana, I remember trying to be like other successful ministers. It didn't work for me. I had to express in my own way, even if that meant occasionally crying during a story I was telling or a personal experience, which for many ministers is a no-no. I love what I do for a living. And I know that people follow those who are inspired by what they love and believe in. No one's inspired by the facts in a message. We might be convinced by them, but we're rarely moved by data. We're moved by the authenticity of a minister being an original. A minister friend of mine said this recently. I make space for everything I deserve, so I let go of everything in my way. What a great way to live. What might you need to let go of so that you can be the original person you are meant to be and deserve love always? At the Big Sky Retreat this week, I got plenty of nuggets, great little sayings, and one of them was this. God is in everything I see. Doing follows seeing. How do we see? By visioning. So let's move to that V in love that's for visioning. Vision implies clear sight and looking down the road. It also inspires passion. No one starts their car and gets into the street without having a destination in mind. And yet I think in life, a lot of times we wake up in the morning with no destination in mind. If you don't have a long-term perspective and some idea of where you're going in your spiritual life, how can you love your life? And like driving, we must each learn to take a long-term perspective, but also being in the now. So we pay attention to those red lights and those stop signs. We endanger our not getting to our destination when we ignore the now. My experience is when I vision, my heart brings up my desires. And I love what Emily Cady said about our heart's desire. Desire in the heart is always God tapping at the door of your consciousness with his infinite supply. A supply which is forever useless unless there is a demand for it. So demand your supply from the divine. Don't let it go unused. And when we vision in a more global way for a world that works for everyone, yes, everyone, then we can see that whatever people call for love, as Karen Mitchell's song said, whatever the question, love is the answer. And the wonderful thing about answering those calls for love with love is that the love comes back to us multiplied abundantly. So what is your vision for you being you and for a love that can move the world? And while having a vision 
and being ourselves and becoming aware of the lens through which we see the world is fabulous, love also requires engagement. So let's take a look at that E for engagement. If we're to witness love moving the world, we must be able to engage in every situation that comes into our lives by responding with love. That's a tall order. And I can hear you saying, yes, but. It's always that but which negates the previous statement. So get the buts out of your life and know always that love can move the world. Hey, when people cut you off in traffic, bless them on their way. Engage in sending out love to them and be grateful that you're not in that big of a hurry, that you actually have time to stop and smell the roses. And who knows, perhaps they have an emergency which is requiring immediate attention, which is why they were in such a big hurry. We can give them the benefit of the doubt. Hey, and when someone you know really well and they know you very well starts to push your buttons, engage yourself in this question. Would I rather have peace or respond in judgment or a non-loving way? I think we could probably all answer that we would rather have peace. The real question is, does your behavior reflect that? I know that mine doesn't always, and I'm working on that. You probably all know my creation versus reaction metaphor. These two words that are made up of exactly the same letters are very much different. We can create our life or we can react to what's happening in our lives. But if you look at the word reaction and take the C out of the center and put it to the beginning so that you see first, you have creation. I would like to say that I live totally my life in creation I know that that's not always the case. That are, there are times in my life when I react. My goal is for the time between my reaction and creation, between my responding without love and responding with love gets shortened. I mentioned in the Celebration and Healing portion introduction today that Ernest Holmes told us Love is the flame of the universe. Let us see that flame growing with each of our responses in life being love. Let us answer the calls for love with love. I started this talk by saying love can move the world. And each of us has to make a decision to see everything as love or a call for love and answer those calls for love with love. I love something that Michael Gott said at the retreat that I've been thinking about. Otherizing is the first short step to dehumanizing. If we are to see a world of love, we must learn to engage in seeing us all as one. There is no other. There's a fabulous four-line poem by John O'Donohue, which I think is a great wrap-up to this message of how to live so that love can move the world. It goes like this. I want to live like the river flows, carried by the surprise of its own becoming. And so in summary, how might you experience 
Love can move the world by answering all calls for love with love. To do this, remember our acronym for love, LENS. Look through the lens of love. Clean the windows through which you see others. Originality. Be love. Love all of who you are. Do what makes you come alive and play big. Vision. Begin with the destination of love. Listen to God tapping on the door of your consciousness with infinite supply for you and grab it. Engagement. Create rather than react to calls for love in your life. Live like the river flows and be carried by the surprise of your own becoming a catalyst for love. So here's the affirmation for the week. How is it I so easily and willingly make the choice today to look at the world through a lens of love, embrace my originality, vision a world of love, and engage in being love? So your challenge for the week is to make a conscious choice this week to see love moving the world. And I also invite you to check in a couple times a day to notice if what you're doing has you feeling alive. And if you've answered any calls for love with love. And if not, be like the pencil. You can correct your mistakes. Let's pray. <sighs> so I take a deep nourishing breath. Hmm. And I just settle into that place within me that knows the highest power that you can conceive of. For me, that's God, the divine spirit. And know that always God is tapping into your consciousness with an infinite supply of everything you need. It's already right within you. You just have to learn to use it. So what I know this week is that each of us is looking at the world through a lens of love, that we are embracing our originality. We are visioning a world of love and being a part of that bigger vision, that higher destination of a world in which everybody feels loved. And engage in being love. <sighs> I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for my life, for this opportunity for me to be a minister, for me to feel all the love that circulates through this community. And it's from that gratitude that I release these words into the law of mind, spirit, and action. Because I know that divine heart of love has already called it done, already called it good. And so I can know it's done and say amen. And I invite you to affirm it together. And so it is. Hmm. I'm so grateful to everyone that continues to contribute. We are having an in-person service at 11 a.m. at Unity of Baton Rouge. I will be sending out more information on September 25th to celebrate 10 years of this community being alive. We are alive and experiencing that sense of love. Enjoy our offertory song. <laughs> 